All right, so the next uh, story I have here for us to talk about, Will, is the leadership in Lebanon, which, uh, surprise, surprise, is going through a change. And uh, we, I think, almost talked about the you know new Lebanon prime minister getting appointed uh, on like show two or three and decided not to because we didn't know much about the guy, wasn't sure what was going to happen with him. Turns out that may have been a good call because he's already leaving his post. So, Will, what's going on with the uh, government there in Lebanon? Yeah, yeah. I believe we covered a little bit of Lebanon stuff on like some of the final episodes of Foreign Policy Focus. So if people are curious to see what we said, uh, but for example, about like the Beirut blast and stuff. I think that we covered that in one of the final episodes there. Maybe we can link that in the show notes. Um, but there's there's been a lot of like political turmoil going on in Lebanon the last like, it, you know, at least for the last year. I mean, you've had these big uh, protests going on and off, uh, largely over the rampant corruption and theft of public resources and all that kind of stuff happening in Lebanon, which has happened under several administrations. Um, you've had the last two prime ministers actually now, uh, uh, both Saad Hariri and Hassan Diab, uh, stepping down because of like public outrage over you know corruption and misconduct and you know just general anger at the government. Um, and you have all that on top of a like severe economic crisis, which is also partially because of the corruption and also driving the protests. And you had all that on top of a pandemic. You've got a lot of things going on in, in uh, Lebanon right now that are really like driving turmoil, and people are generally pissed off about it uh, at the government. Um, but the most recent prime minister, Diab, he only served for like eight months before he eventually stepped down. And that came right after that gigantic blast in Beirut, which, uh, like I said, we covered on a previous episode of Foreign Policy Focus that, you know, leveled a big part of the port. It killed like 200 people, did like billions of dollars in damage. And that only drove the sort of protests and made people even more angry. Um, but right after that, uh, after Diab stepped down, they appointed this new guy to sort of be like an acting prime minister, like a, I think they called him a uh, designate, the PM designate, this guy Mustafa Adib. And um, I think the French helped to broker him in there. Uh, we've explained this on previous shows, but like Lebanon has this, what they call a confessional system, where it's explicitly meets out power to like the different sectarian groups. And so it took a lot of wrangling to get an agreement to, for this new prime minister. Apparently the French helped to, to get him in there. But just on Saturday, this new guy has already quit. Like he uh, apparently spent like a month trying to put together a cabinet. And again, this is all after all this like brokering and negotiation with the French and all the different sects. And finally, he just stepped down like he was uh, struggling to put together a cabinet. Um, there's all, there's all this uh, all this disagreement over who should fill what position, uh, particularly the finance minister position because of Lebanon's like really dire economic uh, you know status right now. People are thinking like they everyone wants their own guy to be in the finance minister position just to make sure like they want him to steer you know steer Lebanon out of a crisis. They want their own group to be in charge of that. Um, apparently, the new guy was Adib was planning on putting a Sunni into the finance uh, minister position, and the the Shia groups like Hezbollah and Amal were like really against that. They protested, and amid all this like uh, dispute and disagreement and stuff, this new guy Adib just stepped down. He just quit and said, "Screw it! Like I, I like I can't, I can't figure this out." I, like I think he even sent out a tweet like, "Sorry, I even tried. Sorry, I tried to form a new government, but like I wish luck to whoever whoever tries next, but I can't do it." And so, like, it does seem like, you know, the last time we talked about Lebanon, they were in, like, a real sort of limbo. People were uh, calling for the um, for Diab to step down. And now we're pretty much back to that same, like, state of limbo where there's just total uncertainty um, about the future, about, what you know, the next prime minister, the, next, the leadership, how they're going to get out of this financial crisis, how the protests are ever going to end. You know, there's all kinds of uncertainty going on. Uh, the French have offered a bailout for Lebanon. But the French say that the, Le the Lebanese have to figure out ways to root out corruption before they'll allow that to happen. They have certain conditions. And so it's just like this is just setting them up for like, you know, a, a perpetual crisis, it seems. And I just think that's unfortunate. Lebanon has been in a crisis for well over a year now, and that's nowhere near ending, it seems. that It's only getting worse. Right. Well, you know, it seems to me one of the, the really difficult things about Lebanon and instability is that everybody is trying to get their hand in on their thing so you know the the french had their colonial interest uh turkey's you know trying to get involved saudi arabia supports their faction of the sunnis uh, a massive a number you know number of people in lebanon are palestinian refugees uh, of course the iranian support hezbollah uh you know the the syrian government was once an occupying power and has their interest the israelis you know are, are very involved and very interested in what happens there and so it, it just seems like a, a situation that almost there's so many things that all can't happen at the same time 
you know something can't both be uh red and black you know i mean it can't be both black and white you know and there's all these discrepancies and it seems like it's it's not as simple as just you know this one thing even if they do get the finance minister thing ha hammered out uh that that still doesn't seem to resolve all the problems including the fact that this is a country that hasn't had a census in almost a century. And they're terrified of knowing how many people of like different sets are in each country. Cause then they'll have to, you know, redo the, uh, the, uh, what did you say? Confessional system where, you know, each yeah. set gets a certain number of, you know, throw the whole thing into chaos and terminal. Uh, so I, you know, I'm not sure what the solution is here, but I bet the Lebanese will figure it out best themselves, especially if Marcon and the French stay home and deal with his own problems. Rather than trying yeah. to flex his colonial muscles. Yeah, no and, kidding. I mean, oh, go ahead. I was just going to add, you know, this is particularly dangerous for the United States. Remember Libya, you know, the, it wasn't necessarily, I I, I think, um, Anne-Marie Slaughter, maybe, or Sam Power, one of the two I know was a big, like, p pusher and driver, but it was really the, you know, a French colonial interest that pushed NATO to take this action here. Uh, and so... You know, you know, it wouldn't be unheard of for, the, you know, the French to get the U.S. involved deeper into this situation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and France definitely has a lot of its own problems to deal with. Macron, you know, he's got his own protest movement on his hands to to deal with, to be, you know, trying to help Lebanon. I mean, I guess it is good. Like they did seem to, you know, smooth out some of the negotiations over picking this new guy. However, I mean, I don't know how, how much they smoothed it over because he resigned and you right. know, it all fell apart. So. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it uh, worked out too well. Maybe an organic, you know, Lebanese choice would be better. But yeah, no 